Part four of the Astral Plane by C. W. Ledbetter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Inhabitants continued. Two, non-human. Though it might have been thought fairly obvious, even to the most casual glance, that many of the terrestrial arrangements of nature which affect us most nearly have not been designed exclusively with a view to our comfort or even our ultimate advantage it was yet probably unavoidable that the human race at least in its childhood should imagine that this world and everything it contains existed solely for its own use and benefit undoubtedly we ought by this time to have grown out of that infantile delusion and realised our proper position and the duties that attach to it that most of us have not yet done so is shown in a dozen ways in our daily life notably by the atrocious cruelty habitually displayed towards the animal kingdom under the name of sport by many who probably consider themselves highly civilised people of course the veriest tyro in the holy science of occultism knows that all life is sacred and that without universal compassion there is no true progress but it is only as he advances in his studies that he discovers how manifold evolution is and how comparatively small a place humanity really fills in the economy of nature it becomes clear to him that just as earth air and water support myriads of forms of life which though invisible to the ordinary eye are revealed to us by the microscope so the higher planes connected with our earth have an equally dense population of whose existence we are ordinarily completely unconscious as his knowledge increases he becomes more and more certain that in one way or another the utmost use is being made of every possibility of evolution and that wherever it seems to us that in nature force or opportunity is being wasted or neglected it is not the scheme of the universe that is in fault but our ignorance of its method and intention for the purposes of our present consideration of the non-human inhabitants of the astral plane it will be best to leave out of consideration those very early forms of the universal life which are evolving in a manner of which we can have little comprehension through the successive encasement of atoms molecules and cells for if we commence at the lowest of what are usually called the elemental kingdoms we shall even then have to group together under this general heading an enormous number of inhabitants of the astral plane upon whom it will be possible to touch only very slightly as anything like a detailed account of them would swell this manual to the dimensions of an encyclopaedia the most convenient method of arranging the non-human entities will perhaps be in four classes it being understood that in this case the class is not as previously a comparatively small subdivision but usually a great kingdom of nature at least as large and varied as say the animal or vegetable kingdom some of these rank considerably below humanity some are our equals and others again rise far above us in goodness and power some belong to our scheme of evolution that is to say they either have been or will be men like ourselves others are evolving on entirely distinct lines of their own before proceeding to consider them it is necessary in order to avoid the charge of incompleteness to mention that in this branch of the subject two reservations have been made first no reference is made to the occasional appearances of very high adepts from other planets of the solar system and of even more august visitors from a still greater distance since such matters cannot fitly be described in an essay for general reading and besides it is practically inconceivable though of course theoretically possible that such glorified beings should ever need to manifest themselves on a plane so low as the astral if for any reason they should wish to do so the body appropriate to the plane would be temporarily created out of astral matter belonging to this planet just as in the case of the nurmanakaya secondly quite outside of and entirely unconnected with the four classes into which we are dividing this section there are two other great evolutions which at present share the use of this planet with humanity but about them it is forbidden to give any particulars at this stage of the proceedings as it is not apparently intended under ordinary circumstances either that they should be conscious of man's existence or man of theirs 
if we ever do come into contact with them, it will most probably be on the purely physical plane, for in any case their connection with our astral plane is of the slightest, since the only possibility of their appearance there depends upon an extremely improbable accident in an act of ceremonial magic, which fortunately only a few of the most advanced sorcerers know how to perform. Nevertheless, that improbable accident has happened at least once, and may happen again, so that, but for the prohibition above mentioned, it would have been necessary to include them in our list. 1. The elemental essence belonging to our own evolution. Just as the name elementary has been given indiscriminately by various writers to any or all of man's possible post-mortem conditions, so this word elemental has been used at various times to mean any or all non-human spirits, from the most godlike of the devas, down through every variety of nature spirit, to the formless essence which pervades the kingdoms lying beyond the mineral, until, after reading several books, the student becomes absolutely bewildered by the contradictory statements made on the subject. For the purposes of this treatise, it will perhaps simplify matters to restrict its meaning to the last-mentioned class only, and use it to denote the three great kingdoms which precede the mineral in the order of our evolution. It may be remembered that in one of the earlier letters from an adept teacher, these elemental kingdoms are referred to, and the statement is made that the first and second cannot readily be comprehended except by an initiate. Fortunately this, the most incomprehensible part of the vast subject, does not come within the province of this manual, as those first and second elemental kingdoms exist and function respectively upon the Arupa and the Rupa levels of the Devachanic plane. We have consequently to deal for the moment only with kingdom number three, the one next before the mineral, though even that will be found to be quite sufficiently complicated, as will be understood when it is stated that it contains just over 2,400 perfectly distinct varieties of elemental essence, each of which the pupil who wishes to attain perfect control of the astral forces must learn not only to distinguish instantly at sight, but to deal with in its own special method and no other. Of course, phenomena of various sorts may be, and constantly are, produced by those who are able to wield only one or two of these forces, but the adept prefers to take the additional trouble requisite to understand all of them thoroughly, and uses in every case precisely the most appropriate force or combination of forces, so that his object may be attained with scientific accuracy and with the least possible expenditure of energy. To speak, as we so often do, of an elemental, in connection with the group we are now considering, is somewhat misleading, for strictly speaking there is no such thing. What we find is a vast store of elemental essence, wonderfully sensitive to the most fleeting human thought, responding with inconceivable delicacy in an infinitesimal fraction of a second, to a vibration set up in it, even by an entirely unconscious exercise of human will or desire. But the moment that, by the influence of such thought or exercise of will, it is moulded into a living force, into something that may correctly be described as an elemental, it at once ceases to belong to the category we are discussing, and becomes a member of the artificial class. Even then, its separate existence is usually of the most evanescent character, and as soon as its impulse has worked itself out, it sinks back into the undifferentiated mass of that particular subdivision of elemental essence from which it came. It would be tedious to attempt to catalogue these subdivisions, and indeed, even if a list of them were made, it would be unintelligible, except to the practical student who can call them up before him and compare them. Some idea of the leading lines of classification can, however, be grasped without much trouble and may prove of interest. First comes the broad division which has given the elementals their name, the classification according to the kind of matter which they inhabit. Here, as usual, the septenary character of our evolution shows itself, for there are seven such chief groups, related respectively to the seven states of physical matter, to earth, water, air and fire, or to translate from medieval symbolism to modern accuracy of expression, to the solid, liquid, gaseous, and etheric conditions. 
it has long been the custom to pity and despise the ignorance of the alchemists of the middle ages because they gave the title of elements to substances which modern chemistry has discovered to be compounds but in speaking of them thus slightingly we have done them great injustice for their knowledge on this subject was really wider not narrower than ours they may or may not have catalogued all the sixty or seventy substances which we now call elements but they certainly did not apply that name to them for their occult studies had taught them that in that sense of the word there was but one element arkasha itself of which these and all other forms of matter were but modifications a truth which some of the greatest chemists of the present day are just beginning to suspect the fact is that in this particular case our despised forefathers analysis went several steps deeper than our own they understood and were able to observe the ether which modern science can only postulate as a necessity for its theories they were aware that it consists of physical matter in four entirely distinct states above the gaseous a fact which has not yet been rediscovered they knew that all physical objects consisted of matter in one or other of these seven states and that into the composition of every organic body all seven entered in a greater or lesser degree hence all their talk of fiery and watery humours or elements which seems so grotesque to us it is obvious that they used the latter word simply as a synonym for constituent parts without in the least degree intending it to connote the idea of substances which could not be further reduced they knew also that each of these orders of matter served as an upadi or basis of manifestation for a great class of evolving monadic essence and so they christened the essence elemental what we have to try to realize then is that in every particle of solid matter so long as it remains in that condition there resides to use the picturesque phraseology of medieval students an earth elemental that is a certain amount of the living elemental essence appropriate to it while equally in every particle of matter in the liquid gaseous or etheric states the water air and fire elementals respectively inhere it will be observed that this first broad division of the third of the elemental kingdoms is so to speak a horizontal one that is to say its respective classes stand in the relation of steps each somewhat less material than the one below it which ascends into it by almost imperceptible degrees and it is easy to understand how each of these classes may again be divided horizontally into seven since there are obviously many degrees of density among solids liquids and gases there is however what may be described as a perpendicular division also and this is somewhat more difficult to comprehend especially as great reserve is always maintained by occultists as to some of the facts which would be involved in a fuller explanation of it perhaps the clearest way to put what is permissible to say on the subject will be to state that in each of the horizontal classes and subclasses will be found seven perfectly distinct types of elemental the difference between them being no longer a question of degree of materiality but rather of character and affinities each of these types so reacts upon the others that though it is impossible for them ever to interchange their essence in each of them seven subtypes will be found to exist distinguished by the colouring given to their original peculiarity by the influence which sways them most readily it will at once be seen that this perpendicular division and subdivision differs entirely in its character from the horizontal in that it is far more permanent and fundamental for while it is the evolution of the elemental kingdom to pass with almost infinite slowness through its various horizontal classes and subclasses in succession and thus to belong to them all in turn this is not so with regard to the types and subtypes which remain unchangeable all the way through a point which must never be lost sight of in endeavouring to understand this elemental evolution is that it is taking place on what is sometimes called the downward curve of the arc that is to say it is progressing towards the complete entanglement in matter which we witness in the mineral kingdom instead of away from it as is most other evolution of which we know anything and this fact sometimes gives it a curiously inverted appearance in our eyes 
until we thoroughly grasp its object. In spite of these manifold subdivisions, there are certain properties which are possessed in common by all varieties of this strange living essence, but even these are so entirely different from any with which we are familiar on the physical plane, that it is exceedingly difficult to explain them to those who cannot themselves see it in action. Let it be premised, then, that when any portion of this essence remains for a few moments entirely unaffected by any outside influence, a condition, by the way, which is hardly ever realised, it is absolutely without any definite form of its own, though even then its motion is rapid and ceaseless. But on the slightest disturbance, set up perhaps by some passing thought current, it flashes into a bewildering confusion of restless, ever-changing shapes, which form, rush about, and disappear with the rapidity of the bubbles on the surface of boiling water. These evanescent shapes, though generally those of living creatures of some sort, human or otherwise, no more express the existence of separate entities in the essence than do the equally changeful and multiform waves raised in a few moments on a previously smooth lake by a sudden squall. They seem to be mere reflections from the vast storehouse of the astral light, yet they have usually a certain appropriateness to the character of the thought stream which calls them into existence, though nearly always with some grotesque distortion, some terrifying or unpleasant aspect about them. A question naturally arises in the mind here as to what intelligence it is that is exerted in the selection of an appropriate shape or its distortion when selected. We are not dealing with the more powerful and longer-lived artificial elemental created by a strong definite thought, but simply with the results produced by the stream of half-conscious involuntary thoughts which the majority of mankind allow to flow idly through their brains, so that the intelligence is obviously not derived from the mind of the thinker, and we certainly cannot credit the elemental essence itself, which belongs to a kingdom further from individualization even than the mineral, with any sort of awakening of the manasic quality. Yet it does possess a marvellous adaptability, which often seems to come very near it. And it is no doubt this property that caused elementals to be described in one of our early books as the semi-intelligent creatures of the astral light. We shall find further evidence of this power when we come to consider the case of the artificial class. When we read of a good or evil elemental, it must always be either an artificial entity or one of the many varieties of nature spirits that is meant, for the elemental kingdoms proper do not admit of any such conceptions as good and evil, though there is undoubtedly a sort of bias or tendency permeating nearly all their subdivisions, which operates to render them rather hostile than friendly towards man, as every neophyte knows, for in most cases his very first impression of the astral plane is of the presence all around him of vast hosts of protean spectres who advance upon him in threatening guise but always retire or dissipate harmlessly if boldly faced it is to this curious tendency that the distorted or unpleasant aspect above mentioned must be referred and medieval writers tell us that man has only himself to thank for its existence in the golden age before this Kali Yuga men were on the whole less selfish and more spiritual, and then the elementals were friendly, though now they are no longer so because of man's indifference to, and want of sympathy with, other living beings. From the wonderful delicacy with which the essence responds to the faintest action of our minds or desires, it seems clear that this elemental kingdom as a whole is very much what the collective thought of humanity makes it. Anyone who will think for a moment how far from elevating the action of that collective thought is likely to be at the present time, will see little reason to wonder that we reap as we have sown, and that this essence, which has no power of perception, but only blindly receives and reflects what is projected upon it, should usually exhibit unfriendly characteristics. There can be no doubt that in later races or rounds, when mankind as a whole has evolved to a much higher level, the elemental kingdoms will be influenced by the changed thought which continually impinges upon them, and we shall find them no longer hostile but docile and helpful, 
as we are told that the animal kingdom will also be. Whatever may have happened in the past, it is evident that we may look forward to a very passable golden age in the future, if we can arrive at a time when the majority of men will be noble and unselfish, and the forces of nature will cooperate willingly with them. The fact that we are so readily able to influence the elemental kingdoms at once shows us that we have a responsibility towards them for the manner in which we use that influence. Indeed, when we consider the conditions under which they exist, it is obvious that the effects produced upon them by the thoughts and desires of all intelligent creatures inhabiting the same world with them must have been calculated upon in the scheme of our system as a factor in their evolution. In spite of the consistent teaching of all the great religions, the mass of mankind is still utterly regardless of its responsibility on the thought plane. If a man can flatter himself that his words and deeds have been harmless to others, he believes that he has done all that can be required of him, quite oblivious of the fact that he may for years have been exercising a narrowing and debasing influence on the minds of those about him, and filling surrounding space with the unlovely creations of a sordid mind. A still more serious aspect of this question will come before us when we discuss the artificial elemental, but in regard to the essence it will be sufficient to state that we undoubtedly have the power to accelerate or delay its evolution, according to the use which consciously or unconsciously we are continually making of it. It would be hopeless within the limits of such a treatise as this to attempt to explain the different uses to which the forces inherent in the manifold varieties of this elemental essence can be put by one who has been trained in their management. The vast majority of magical ceremonies depend almost entirely upon its manipulation, either directly by the will of the magician, or by some more definite astral entity evoked by him for that purpose. By its means, nearly all the physical phenomena of the seance room are produced, and it is also the agent in most cases of stone-throwing or bell-ringing in haunted houses, such results as these latter being brought about either by blundering efforts to attract attention made by some earth-bound human entity, or by the mere mischievous pranks of some of the minor nature spirits belonging to our third class. But the elemental must never be thought of as itself a prime mover. It is simply a latent force which needs an external power to set it in motion. It may be noted that although all classes of the essence have the power of reflecting images from the astral light as described above, there are varieties which receive certain impressions much more readily than others, which have, as it were, favourite forms of their own into which, upon disturbance, they would naturally flow unless absolutely forced into some other, and such shapes tend to be a trifle less evanescent than usual. Before leaving this branch of the subject, it may be well to warn the student against the confusion of thought into which some have fallen, through failing to distinguish this elemental essence which we have been considering, from the monadic essence, manifesting through the mineral kingdom. It must be borne in mind the monadic essence, at one stage of its evolution towards humanity, manifests through the elemental kingdom, while at a later stage it manifests through the mineral kingdom, but the fact that two bodies of monadic essence at these different stages are in manifestation at the same moment, and that one of these manifestations, the earth elemental, occupies the same space as, and inhabits the other, say a rock, in no way interferes with the evolution either of one or the other, nor does it imply any relation between the bodies of monadic essence lying within both. The rock will also be permeated by its appropriate variety of the omnipresent jiva, or life principle, but that of course is again totally distinct from either of the essences above mentioned. The Karma Rupas of Animals This is an extremely large class, yet it does not occupy a particularly important position on the astral plane, since its members usually stay there but a very short time. The vast majority of animals have not as yet acquired permanent individualization, and when one of them dies, the monadic essence which has been manifesting through it flows back again into the particular stratum whence it came, bearing with it such advancement or experience as has been attained during that life. 
it is not however able to do this quite immediately the karmic aura of the animal forms itself into a karma rupa just as in man's case and the animal has a real existence on the astral plane the length of which though never great varies according to the intelligence which it has developed in most cases it does not seem to be more than dreamily conscious but appears perfectly happy the comparatively few domestic animals who have already attained individuality and will therefore be reborn no more as animals in this world have a much longer and much more vivid life in karma loka than their less advanced fellows and at the end of it sink gradually into a subjective condition which is likely to last for a very considerable period one interesting subdivision of this class consists of the karma rupas of those anthropoid apes mentioned in the secret doctrine volume one page one hundred and eighty four who are already individualized and will be ready to take human incarnation in the next round or perhaps some of them even sooner three nature spirits of all kinds so many and so varied are the subdivisions of this class that to do them anything like justice one would need to devote a separate treatise to this subject alone some characteristics however they all have in common and it will be sufficient here to try to give some idea of those to begin with we have to realize that we are here dealing with entities which differ radically from all that we have hitherto considered though we may rightly classify the elemental essence and the animal kamarupa as non-human the monadic essence which manifests itself through them will nevertheless in the fullness of time evolve to the level of manifesting itself through some future humanity comparable to our own and if we were able to look back through countless ages on our own evolution in previous manvantaras we should find that which is now ourselves has passed on its upward path through similar stages that however is not the case with the vast kingdom of nature spirits they neither have been nor ever will be members of a humanity such as ours their line of evolution is entirely different and their only connection with us consists in our temporary occupancy of the same planet of course since we are neighbours for the time being we owe neighbourly kindness to one another when we happen to meet but our lines of development differ so widely that each can do but little for the other many writers have included these spirits among the elementals and indeed they are the elementals or perhaps to speak more accurately the animals of a higher evolution though much more highly developed than our elemental essence they have yet certain characteristics in common with it for example they also are divided into seven great classes inhabiting respectively the same seven states of matter already mentioned as permeated by the corresponding varieties of the essence thus to take those which are most readily comprehensible to us there are spirits of the earth water air and fire or ether definite intelligent astral entities residing and functioning in each of those media it may be asked how it is possible for any kind of creature to inhabit the solid substance of a rock or of the crust of the earth the answer is that since the nature spirits are formed of astral matter the substance of the rock is no hindrance to their motion or their vision and furthermore physical matter in its solid state is their natural element the only one to which they are accustomed and in which they feel at home the same is of course true of those who live in water air or ether in medieval literature these earth spirits are often called gnomes while the water spirits are spoken of as undines the air spirits as sylphs and the ether spirits as salamanders in popular language they are known by many names fairies pixies elves brownies peris gins trolls satyrs fauns kobolds imps goblins good people etc some of these titles being applied only to one variety and others indiscriminately to all their forms are many and various but most frequently human in shape and somewhat diminutive in size like almost all inhabitants of the astral plane they are able to assume any appearance at will but they undoubtedly have definite forms of their own or perhaps we should rather say favourite forms which they wear when they have no special object in taking any other of course 
under ordinary conditions they are not visible to physical sight at all but they have the power of making themselves so by materialization when they wish to be seen there are an immense number of subdivisions or races among them and individuals of these subdivisions differ in intelligence and disposition precisely as human beings do the great majority of them apparently prefer to avoid man altogether his habits and emanations are distasteful to them and the constant rush of astral currents set up by his restless ill-regulated desires disturbs and annoys them on the other hand instances are not wanting in which nature spirits have as it were made friends with human beings and offered them such assistance as lay in their power as in the well-known stories told of the scotch brownies or of the fire-lighting fairies mentioned in spiritualistic literature this helpful attitude however is comparatively rare and in most cases when they come in contact with man they either show indifference or dislike or else take an impish delight in deceiving him and playing childish tricks upon him many a story illustrative of this curious characteristic may be found among the village gossip of the peasantry in almost any lonely mountainous district and any one who has been in the habit of attending seances for physical phenomena will recollect instances of practical joking and silly though usually good-natured horse-play which always indicate the presence of some of the lower orders of the nature spirits they are greatly assisted in their tricks by the wonderful power which they possess of casting a glamour over those who yield themselves to their influence so that such victims for the time see and hear only what these fairies impress upon them exactly as the mesmerised subject sees hears feels and believes whatever the magnetizer wishes the nature spirits however have not the mesmerizer's power of dominating the human will except in the case of quite unusually weak-minded people or of those who allow themselves to fall in such a condition of helpless terror that their will is temporarily in abeyance they cannot go beyond deception of the senses but of that art they are undoubted masters and cases are not wanting in which they have cast their glamour over a considerable number of people at once it is by invoking their aid in the exercise of this peculiar power that some of the most wonderful feats of the indian jugglers are performed the entire audience being in fact hallucinated and made to imagine that they see and hear a whole series of events which have not really taken place at all we might almost look upon the nature spirits as a kind of astral humanity but for the fact that none of them not even the highest possess a permanent reincarnating individuality apparently therefore one point in which their line of evolution differs from ours is that a much greater proportion of intelligence is developed before permanent individualization takes place but of the stages through which they have passed and those through which they have yet to pass we can know little the life periods of the different subdivisions vary greatly some being quite short others much longer than our human lifetime we stand so entirely outside such a life as theirs that it is impossible for us to understand much about its conditions but it appears on the whole to be a simple joyous irresponsible kind of existence much such as a party of happy children might lead among exceptionally favourable physical surroundings though tricky and mischievous they are rarely malicious and less provoked by some unwarrantable intrusion or annoyance but as a body they also partake to some extent of the universal feeling of distrust for man and they generally seem inclined to resent somewhat the first appearance of a neophyte on the astral plane so that he usually makes their acquaintance under some unpleasant or terrifying form if however he declines to be frightened by any of their freaks they soon accept him as a necessary evil and take no further notice of him while some among them may even after a time become friendly and manifest pleasure on meeting him some among the many subdivisions of this class are much less childlike and more dignified than those we have been describing and it is from these sections that the entities who have sometimes been reverenced under the name of wood gods or local village gods have been drawn such entities would be quite sensible of the flattery involved in the reverence shown to them would enjoy it and would no doubt be quite ready to do any small service they could in return the village god is also often an artificial entity 
but that variety will be considered in its appropriate place the adept knows how to make use of the services of the nature spirits when he requires them but the ordinary magician can obtain their assistance only by processes either of invocation or evocation that is either by attracting their attention as a suppliant and making some kind of bargain with them or by endeavouring to set in motion influences which would compel their obedience both methods are extremely undesirable and the latter is also excessively dangerous as the operator would arouse a determined hostility which might prove fatal to him needless to say no one studying occultism under a qualified master would ever be permitted to attempt anything of the kind at all four the devas the highest system of evolution connected with this earth so far as we know is that of the beings whom hindus call the devas and who have elsewhere been spoken of as angels sons of god etc they may in fact be regarded as a kingdom lying next above humanity in the same way as humanity in turn lies next above the animal kingdom but with this important difference that while for an animal there is no possibility of evolution through any kingdom but the human man when he attains a certain high level finds various paths of advancement opening before him of which this great deva evolution is only one in comparison with the sublime renunciation of the nirmanakaya the acceptance of this line of evolution is sometimes spoken of in the books as yielding to the temptation to become a god but it must not be inferred from this expression that any shadow of blame attaches to the man who makes this choice the path he selects is not the shortest but it is nevertheless a very noble one and if his developed intuition impels him towards it it is probably the one best suited for his capacities we must never forget that in spiritual as in physical climbing it is not every one who can bear the strain of the steeper path there may be many for whom what seems the slower way is the only one possible and we should indeed be unworthy followers of the great teachers if we allowed our ignorance to betray us into the slightest thought of despisal towards those whose choice differs from our own however confident that ignorance of the difficulties of the future may allow us to feel now it is impossible for us to tell at this stage what we shall find ourselves able to do when after many lives of patient striving we have earned the right to choose our own future and indeed even those who yield to the temptation to become gods have a sufficiently glorious career before them as will presently be seen to avoid possible misunderstanding it may be mentioned par parenthes that there is another and entirely evil sense sometimes attached in the books to this phrase of becoming a god but in that form it certainly could never be any kind of temptation to the developed man and in any case it is altogether foreign to our present subject in oriental literature this word deva is frequently used vaguely to mean almost any kind of non-human entity so that it would often include dian chohans on the one hand and nature spirits and artificial elementals on the other here however its use will be restricted to the magnificent evolution which we are now considering though connected with this earth the devas are by no means confined to it for the whole of our present chain of seven worlds is as one world to them their evolution being through a grand system of seven chains their hosts have hitherto been recruited chiefly from other humanities in the solar system some lower and some higher than ours since but a very small portion of our own has as yet reached the level at which for us it is possible to join them but it seems certain that some of their very numerous classes have not passed in their upward progress through any humanity at all comparable to ours it is not possible for us at present to understand very much about them but it is clear that what may be described as the aim of their evolution is considerably higher than ours that is to say while the object of our human evolution is to raise the successful portion of humanity to a certain degree of occult development by the end of the seventh round the object of the deva evolution is to raise their foremost rank to a very much higher level in the corresponding period for them as for us a steeper but shorter path to still more sublime heights lies open to earnest endeavour 
but what those heights might be in their case we can only conjecture it is of course only the lower fringe of this august body that need be mentioned in connection with our subject of the astral plane their three lower great divisions beginning from the bottom are generally called karma devas rupa devas and arupa devas respectively just as our ordinary body here the lowest body possible for us is the physical so the ordinary body of a karma deva is the astral so that he stands in somewhat the same position as humanity will do when it reaches planet f and he living ordinarily in an astral body would go out of it to higher spheres in a maya virupa just as we might in an astral body while to enter the karana sharira would be to him when sufficiently developed no greater effort than to form a maya virupa is to us in the same way the rupa deva's ordinary body would be the maya virupa since his habitat is on the four lower or rupa levels of the spiritual state which we usually call devachan while the arupa deva belongs to the three higher levels of that plane and owns no nearer approach to a body than the karana sharira but for rupa and arupa devas to manifest on the astral plane is an occurrence at least as rare as it is for astral entities to materialize on this physical plane so we need do no more than mention them now as regards the lowest division the karma devas it would be quite a mistake to think of all of them as immeasurably superior to ourselves since some have entered their ranks from a humanity in some respects less advanced than our own of course the general average among them is much higher than among us for all that is actively or wilfully evil has long been weeded out from their ranks but they differ widely in disposition and a really noble and selfish spiritually minded man may well stand higher in the scale of evolution than some of them their attention can be attracted by certain magical evocations but the only human will which can dominate theirs is that of a certain high class of adepts as a rule they seem scarcely conscious of us on our physical plane but it does now and then happen that one of them becomes aware of some human difficulty which excites his pity and he perhaps renders some assistance just as any of us would try to help an animal that we saw in trouble but it is well understood among them that any interference in human affairs at the present stage is likely to do far more harm than good above the arupa devas there are four other great divisions and again above and beyond the deva kingdom altogether stand the great hosts of the dhyan chohans but the consideration of such glorified beings would be out of place in an essay on the astral plane though we cannot claim them as belonging exactly to any of our classes this is perhaps the best place in which to mention those wonderful and important beings the four devarajas in this name the word deva must not however be taken in the sense in which we have been using it for it is not over the deva kingdom but over the four elements of earth water air and fire with their indwelling nature spirits and essences that these four kings rule what the evolution has been through which they rose to their present height of power and wisdom we cannot tell save only that it has certainly not passed through anything corresponding to our own humanity they are often spoken of as the regents of the earth or angels of the four cardinal points and the hindu books call them the chatur maharajas giving their names as tritarashtra virudaka virupaksha and vaishravana in the same books their hosts are called gandavas kumbandas nagas and yakshas respectively the points of the compass appropriated to each being in corresponding order east south west and north and their symbolical colours white blue red and gold they are mentioned in the secret doctrine as winged globes and fiery wheels and in the christian bible ezekiel makes a very remarkable attempt at a description of them in which very similar words are used references to them are to be found in the symbology of every religion and they have always been held in the highest reverence as the protectors of mankind it is they who are the agents of man's karma during his life on earth and they thus play an extremely important part in human destiny the lipika the great karmic deities of the cosmos 
weigh the deeds of each personality when the final separation of its principles takes place in karma loka and give as it were the mould of an etheric double exactly suitable to its karma for the man's next birth but it is the devarajas who having command of the elements of which that etheric double must be composed arrange their proportion so as to fulfil accurately the intention of the lipika it is they also who constantly watch all through life to counterbalance the changes perpetually being introduced into man's condition by his own free will and that of those around him so that no injustice may be done and karma may be accurately worked out if not in one way then in another a learned dissertation upon these marvellous beings will be found in the secret doctrine volume one pages one hundred and twenty two to one hundred and twenty six they are able to take human material forms at will and several cases are recorded where they have done so all the higher nature spirits and hosts of artificial elementals act as their agents in the stupendous work they carry out yet all the threads are in their hands and the whole responsibility rests upon their 